we know that this is not an ideal time for everybody, but luckily we have um, probably about 30 plus that are you know virtual as well. So we're excited about the opportunity to see y'all in person and for y'all to be in the school, but also just have our, our wise teachers to kind of share some things that will help y'all with the transition um, to kindergarten. So I want to introduce everybody. Um, this is Ms. Taylor. She's one of our pre-K teachers. Ms. Amanda Young, she's also one of our pre-K teachers. Bubble gum over here, Ms. Tucker is one of our inclusion teachers. Ms. Hardy is another one of our kindergarten teachers. We have Ms. Dexter in the back. And then Ms. McCain is acting as parent, but she's also a teacher here as well. Um, so she's gonna get double the duty. So, um, of course, I'm Haley, I'm the principal here, and I just wanna tell y'all, and I think I say, say this every time I see y'all, but just what a joy these kids have been this year. So we appreciate y'all allowing us to um, have them and love them the way that we have.
So when we talk about listening, it is looking at what we call in my classroom whole body listening. You know, their eyes are on you, their body is still, they're thinking about what you're saying so that when you ask them that question, they can give you the answer. A lot of times we get tickled out in the room where we say, okay, now, okay, when I ask my question, you raise your hand. Before you ever get the question up, their <laughs> hands are up, you know, it's like, wait, stop, think first. So I taught mine, they take their little fingers, they put them on the hair, okay, we're gonna think here. This is talking, this is thinking, so let's put it in here first, let's think about it, and then we'll talk about it. So it's just getting that process in for that listening skills. Um, speaking, we're looking at, oh, let me go back one more thing on the listening, because I know some question all the parents have, they never listen, they're just going this way and that way. At this age, for a five-year-old, research shows that their attention spans only gonna be five to 10 minutes. That's it, if you get them to talk for 10 minutes, you're good. That's what they need, okay? Now, by the time they get into kindergarten and get halfway you know, through the kindergarten year and towards the end, their attention span is gonna be 20 to 25 minutes. But right now, five to 10 minutes is about the most you're going to get. So when you are working with them at home with stuff, understand, okay, let's do three to five minutes. They just don't know. They'll come back a little bit more because it's gonna take a while for that to, to build up. Uh, speaking, what we're getting at there is just, we've worked with them to Speak in complete sentences, you know, not just give a one word answer for a question, but to really give us all those words, you know, in there for that. Uh, we look at the basic grammar. Instead of saying, me saw this, we make sure they say I, and we use those as correct pronouns. Uh, vocabulary is just building that. We want to give them as many words as they possibly can. And don't be afraid of the big words. We, um, we use them in our room. We'll say, okay, let's slap out the syllables. Let's tap the syllables in the word. Explain what the word is meaning. Don't be afraid of them. Really use them with them. With literacy, what we're looking at for the language development here, <coughs> that part, the main thing here is looking at literature awareness, concepts of prints, and the writing process. Now, when we talk literature awareness, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Um, print awareness, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later as well, but that's looking at book front and back and all of that. Um, the writing process for us and what it looks like here is going to be a little different than when they get in kindergarten. For us, we're looking at collaborative work where they're dictating to us what they want to say or we're creating a story together as we work together. You know, the differences between nonfiction books and fiction books. You know, do they like books? What kind of books do they like? So then we build off of that with their writing process. So it's a little bit different than what's in kindergarten, they're gonna do a little bit more with it. Uh, and that's not, I'm gonna talk a little bit later about the actual process of them holding the pencil and writing themselves. Um, cognitive development, that's referring to their, the, your child's knowledge of the world around them. You know, what goes on around them, are they aware of it? Um, they have to think about things that aren't currently present in their world, but they've got their memories to know. So we're talking about it outside when you went to the farm, that sort of thing. So it's them thinking about what they know and what they're learning and applying it to what they're doing in the classroom. Um, it looks at, I'm trying to think how I want to say this, social knowledge, I guess is what I want to say. You know, problem solving. Can they solve their problems without a lot of us? You know, we've got to work with them first to teach them how to solve that problem then we want to push them to start doing it themselves. Don't come to me, go talk to your friend, remember what you can do. Um, it's more than just recognizing shapes and colors and numbers of that. It's really about that world around them. Um, the other area is physical and motor development. That is fine motor and gross motor skills. A lot of times you'll hear teachers talk about those. Um, but it also looks at their physical fitness. You know, we're looking at their Health. We teach them healthy habits there. We make sure they've got plenty of time outside, loose up in the gym. You know, we're really working on that physical um, gross motor skills, as we say. Now, one thing I would say about this is it is highly individualized. One child is not going to be at the same place as another. Even if they're the same age, they could even be born same day, same month. They're not going to be the same. It's a little bit different for each child. So we have to look at the child as they come to us and go from there. Uh, you know, we look at scissors, you know, we're 
building the muscles in the hand. We are looking at play data. I know sometimes y'all think, well, why are we playing with play data at school? But that's what it is. It's building the muscle. It gets them ready for the writing they know when they get into play play. Um, and it's, you know, they just, it's going to take time for some. They're going to get there real quick. Sometimes for others, it takes a little bit longer. Um, the gross motor here, what we're working on here is they can throw, they can catch. Hopping, skipping. Know, knowing the difference between a gallop and a skip is hard for them sometimes. And we call that, that's the cross action. And that actually improves their reading later on because it's making their brain work to go across. So it's, you know, it's one thing there. And then the last domain is the social emotional development. And this is just referring to your child's self esteem. You know, how are they getting along with their friends? How are they interacting with the adults in their life? Um, the ability to listen to other people's points of views, the ability to help their friends. If they see their friends hurt or crying, they can stop what they're doing and they'll go and help, you know. So that's what that is looking at. It's also looking at their desire to make new friends. So, you know, they, they did that here, but when they go off to kindergarten, it's a whole other class. So they might know one person in there and they might not know anybody. So it's their ability to take what we've taught them here to be social to go there and work with that as well. Um, between people <coughs> that are the you know, not throwing the toys around the room, that sort of thing. Uh, sharing and taking turns, all of those <coughs> things that we talk about, paying attention for the short periods of time, that's all part of that social and emotional development. <coughs> to learn new things. Um, keep that enthusiasm going with as long, long as they see that you're excited about them going to school and all the new things that they're learning, they're going to pick up on that um, enthusiasm. And so I just encourage you to just be, every time we talk about school, be happy, be peppy about it. If there's something that happens and you don't like what happened at school, make sure you're away from your child and you're talking about it. I learned that as a mama myself. When I talk about things in front of my little one, who's, she's four, I forget. She can still hear me, and she still understands now. And so I need to remove myself when I'm talking about negative things that don't involve her. Um, solid oral language skills. They're going to want your child. Like I said, a lot of this is going to be a lot of what Miss Young said. We're going to repeat ourselves often. We're going to repeat <laughs> ourselves. But kindergarten just kind of ups it a notch. Um, those kindergarten teachers are going to want them to be able to speak clearly. That does not mean if they have an articulation problem, which, you know, requires speech, that, that's not what we're talking about. Just being able to, something I can't do right now, hello, get their thoughts across clearly um, and get their wants and so their wants and needs can be met by that kindergarten teacher. Um, speaking in the complete sentences, um, if they are not able to say a word, knowing that they can gesture or point um, to help them out. Also holding conversations, using complete sentences, like we just said, but with their peers, being able to talk to their peers, a lot of that, um, the conflict resolution that we've encouraged through our center time here, when they have a problem with each other and how to talk it out and giving them those skills that they need there. When, um, when you're at the park this summer, maybe you'll go to the park, or when you're out somewhere this summer and there's new kids around, try to encourage your child to say, hey, why don't you go ask their name? You know, go play with them and see what they want to do. And just, you'll have to give them the words first. Say, go tell them, say, hey, my name's Macy. I'll use my kids. Hey, my name's Macy. What's your name? Go tell them, tell them just go say that to their new friend. And try to spark some conversations with peers. They still need help at this point, but that'll get them ready to make new friends in kindergarten. Um, so, and then the ability to listen is kind of the other end of that too. We, they need to be able to follow simple instructions, follow multiple simple instructions at one time. Like, 
three-step directions. Go get your pencil, write your name, flip it over on the back, like stuff like that. And you, that's stuff you can practice at home this summer. Even just by doing like Simon Says, Simon Says, and give them three or four things in a row, and even build up and see how many they can do at one time, just to build those listening skills. Um, being able to sit through an age-appropriate story without interrupting. Amanda talked about the attention span, so remember their attention span is only five to ten minutes right now, and that's going to stay the same for a little while. But building that attention span by reading the book, but while you're reading the book, ask them questions about the book. Get them interested in the book. Look at the pictures with them and say, ooh, what do you think is going to happen next in the book? Um, that'll help keep their attention span on it longer. And then they need to be able to pay attention for short periods of time to adult-directed activities. And, I mean, we do that all the time at home. I know at my house, <laughs> Macy, I need you to do, you know, just giving them some, some something to do and wanting them to pay attention. Even um, if you go to a church service, um, Maybe not letting them sit in there the whole time. I don't know. I'm just thinking back on, as a mama personally, what I would do, some things. But let them sit in there for a little while and have to be quiet and pay attention and then remove them when you need to. All right, Miss Hardy, are you ready? Sure. Um, the desire to be independent. This is going to include finishing a task um, after it started, to complete the task that they started. And these are some things that we um, work on during our center time as well. It's getting a, having them have a task and completing it. Um, they can separate from parents without excessive crying. And that's hard at the beginning of the year a lot of times because it's going to be new faces, new school, um, different environments. So that can be tough. And there's if you wanted just a small picture or just something from home small that could fit in the backpack to help them ease that uh, separation when they start a new school. Um, they can verbalize their wants and needs, and that's something that's really important, and that's something that we do work on here too as well, with getting them to express what it is that they need help with, um, what do they want, instead of um, like getting upset, we encourage them, and we'll have to give them the words too to say, I need help with opening my milk carton, or I need help, instead of just like sitting there and not asking for help, or just completely getting upset. Um, and those are things you can work on at home too with you know, making sure they verbalize what it is they need and what it is they want. Um, and they can work independently for short periods of time. And again, attention span, five to 10 minutes. So if the task is going 20 minutes, it may be you know, getting into some frustration level. Um, but you could just short set like a short timer and have them work on something um, like sorting objects or like practicing their name or practicing their numbers or something like that for just a short period of time. Um, with them working by themselves without asking for help for you to help them write their numbers or write their name or to sort the objects. Um, and they can make simple choices just between um, chocolate or white milk or something you know, of that nature. And they can manage their own bathroom needs. They can um, button and unbutton their clothes, zip their pants. Um, all right, and the ability to play well with others is the next mm -hmm. one. Uh, treat others in a respectful manner. And that's, again, things that we work on here. We give them the words, we model how to say it. If they have a problem with a friend during centers or on the playground, um, we teach them to say, you know, I don't like it when you do that. And if they need help, we tell them to come to us and we will help them with their words and help them with the problem. Um, but we encourage them to try and work it out first before coming to us for help and respect, respect the property of others um, if it's not yours. You know, you don't get to take, touch it and play with it. It's going to get broken. Um, in the hallway, we have cubbies, and we try to teach them, you know, that that's not our cubby, so they need to stay out of our cubby. And to be respectful with our materials, like our books in the library, we treat them with respect, our blocks, all of our other materials that we use. Um, share and take turns with others. That's kind of a tough one, I think, at all ages. Um, but we try to encourage them to say, hey, you're playing with the blocks. Can I see the blocks when you're done? And to use their words to articulate what they need. Again, going back to the wants and needs. Um, and if your child is struggling with this area, you can model and assist children in proper ways to join groups, conversations, or center activities with other, other children. 
And again, this goes back to the modeling the language and showing them, giving them the words and helping them through it at first and then kind of easing off and letting them work toward being independent in those areas. Um, strong fine motor skills. And again, Ms. Young talked about the Play-Doh and that works those fine motor, works those muscles, gets them ready for riding. Uh, manipulating buttons and um, zippers on their belongings, being able to like zip, unzip backpacks, mm -hmm. zip the zippers on their pants, working on butt pinch, uh, buttoning the buttons on their pants too. Uh, trace and copy basic shapes. Just taking the pencil and tracing over triangles, rectangles, squares, just so they're working those fine motor muscles, being able to manipulate that, writing first name, um, using crayon, paint, paste, scissors, pencils, and clay appropriately. And again, the clay is going to provide that resistance. It's going to work those fine motor muscles. And then drawing rather than scribbling. So when they draw a picture, it looks like a house rather than they just scribbled on the paper. And they're looking at the shapes, they're looking at the size, the different colors. Um, literacy and math skills include phonological and phonemic awareness, and they're key predictors of success and learning to read. Um, and our, early state, our state's early learning standards guide us in aligning pre-K phonemic awareness instruction with kindergarten expectations. And we've used Hagerty for the past three years, I think, and it's really fantastic, it's really phenomenal. It hits on all those um, phonemic and phonological awareness skills. It's very interactive, there's a lot of motion with it, and it's repetitive, it goes over, hits all the skills every single day. And it's just, it's a small chunk of time so they don't lose interest quickly. So it, and it's really fast paced, but it's really great. And I've seen a really big difference in using it to supplement um, our curriculum as well. Um, and phonological awareness refers to the detection and manipulation in words and sentences, compound words, breaking compound words apart, like dog house, and then putting it back together to make the word. Um, the syllables in words, how many parts are in the word, Onsets and rhymes. Onset is the beginning, rhyme is the end, and then the individual phonemes in the words, the individual sounds. Um, it, phonemic awareness refers to detecting and manipulating individual sounds and words, the beginning, the middle, and the end of the word. Those are all things, again, that we work on, that we've been working on with Hagerty. We have things in centers that they're working on and mentioned that they're manipulating, but they'll just see more of that when they go toward kindergarten. Um, recognizing rhyme is another one of the phonological and phonemic awareness skills. Um, that's one that's kind of tough. Um, and it's one we work on a lot and practice a lot, and then we'll see that again as well. Recognizing size and position words, big, small, up, down, under, and over. Um, identifying some letter sounds. Identifying letters of the alphabet. Sorting objects by color, size, and shape. Recognizing groups of five objects. Count and recognize numbers up to ten, and recognizing their first and their last name. next it's gonna be a lot but I'm just gonna kind of this is what literacy skills they will cover the first nine weeks in kindergarten pretty much we've already done all of these we start in third nine weeks and then fourth nine weeks we're already covering all of these so when they get into kindergarten they've got that strong foundation to go ahead and build off of it um, I'm not gonna read through all of them I'm just gonna kind of touch base on a few of them um, as Ms. Hardy was talking about with the phonemic awareness and all of that. Um, that's their liter part, the biggest part of their literacy there. Um, what I'm going to kind of focus a little bit more on what we call the pre reading skills. This is, we're not actually giving them the book and teaching them, okay, read. That's what they're going to do in kindergarten. Now, some of them might be ready for it here, and we may have already started it, but our main goal is for them to look at where does the story begin? Where does the story end? Where does the sentence begin? Where does the sentence end? We talk about punctuation marks. We talk about the first letter of a sentence is always going to be capitalized and all the others will be lowercase. We talk about the punctuation marks. All the time I'm asking, well, what goes at the end of a sentence? And somebody will say, question mark. And so I'll say, well, are you asking a question or are you telling something? So it's just kind of we're giving them that background information. We look at where the title of the book is. We look at what an author does, what an illustrator does. We look at where you find their names on the book as well. Um, we take the time to stop every so often, as they were talking about when you're reading a story with a child, to ask them questions about the details, the characters, the settings, the events in the story. But I would challenge you as well 
to teach them how to sit and listen without any interruptions. You don't stop either. You start at the beginning of the story and you read all the way through and then ask your questions at the end. A lot of times with mine in my classroom, I'll put a little sticky note at the back of the book and they know a question is gonna come. So I might go ahead and talk about what they need to know and what they need to listen for and then I'm gonna read the story without any interruptions and then I'll ask that question at the end of the story and see if they've heard it. Um, connect the stories to them, you know, when you're talking to them. Well, when did you build a bike? Or when did you go ride a car? You know, that sort of thing. Connect it to their life as well. And that works and helps with that comprehension, which is one of the hardest struggles that they have um, to make sure that they listen and understand what's going on in the story. Um, she mentioned rhyming. I want to do a little bit more with that. There are three stages of rhyming. The first one is just hearing the rhyme. You're saying nursery rhymes with them. Um, you're reading little rhyming stories. That's the first part. The second part is recognizing the rhyme. And that's when you'll see us do a lot of matching. You know, they have the picture cat, and then underneath that they have a hat, a ball, and a rock. And then they've got to find, well, cat and hat rhymes. They're using their visual skills to figure out what the rhyming is. Uh, the third stage is actually producing the rhyme. I give them the word cat, they can tell me hat rhyme. You know, they just give these words to us. Um, and as Ms. Hardy said, it is one of the hardest ones, but research is showing that there is a very strong correlation between their rhyming skills and their reading ability. So they tie in together. So it's very important to keep up with it. And like, it is hard, it is hard. They may leave here and not be able to do it yet, and that's okay. They'll get it in kindergarten. But that's just have fun with it. Read those rhyming books, do the nursery rhymes, come up with silly rhyming words when you're in the car driving somewhere, you know. Let's come up with a list of words that rhyme with fish and then you just mish, fish, and you know, just coming up with fun words with them just to make it fun for them. Um, another part that they talk about down here towards the end of these skills are the writing skills. What we're looking at here that we've worked with them is writing their first name and their last name. Uh, we have looked at writing their letters as well and numbers. Uh, I would suggest if you're, if you're working with them at home over the summer to kind of work a little bit more on writing those letters, talk about what the letter looks like. Which ones are straight lines? Which ones have curvy lines? Uh, you know, just an example, a lot of mine, they could not write the letter H. They still struggle with it. They want to make it look like an N. So we had to talk about how tall the line is. And then I'll tell them, let's go to the middle. We're going to draw a heel. So we'll use words like that. That's what they're familiar with. So that kind of helps them a little bit with writing those. Um, there is a little, we kind of start it towards the end. Um, I know I've done it a couple times, Mr. Dexter has. It's a little thing called draw a story, write a story. So you divide your paper in half. Top part, they draw their picture, whatever their story is about. On the bottom half is when you work to write it. So, Again, at the beginning, we're just dictating. They're telling us what to write, and we're writing it out there. I'm encouraging them now. Um, I don't have a pencil in here. I'd show you on the board. But what kid writing looks like, what adult writing looks like. So if they're going to write the sentence, the cat is black, I show them. I said, if you do all squiggly lines and put a dot at the end, that's your punctuation mark. If you can tell me what you wrote, then you wrote the cat is black. And then underneath it, I can write the cat is black. So that's adult writing. Um, but we're also pushing now for those three letter words, k, at, all right, let's write it out. You know, we spell it out, they'll say, okay, I'm gonna write a C, okay, that's A, and then that's T. So they're working to go ahead and start writing their sentences out. Uh, we have done sight words. This is, we started a new curriculum this year. So this is the first curriculum in my 25 years teaching pre-K that has focused with sight words. I've had to learn some stuff on how to work with them with sight words. Um, and again, so it's some, we've got them up on the room, and it might be something you might want to ask your child's teacher, would you send me a list of the sight words you've worked on so you have them at home? Um, and then that way you can continue to expose them to that. And if you're writing with them, okay, well, what's the first word in your sentence? You said V. So go find the word V and then write it out, you know, and then you can work with them with those smaller words as they're going as well. Um, think if there was anything else there. I 
think that was all I was going to cover. Like I said, there's a lot of literacy skills. That is the basis for a great deal of stuff to come as they go through first grade, second grade, and all. Um, if you want to take a picture of this towards the end, if you want to know it for yourself, you're more than welcome to. I'll put it back on here, and you can come take a picture and have time to read through it. Um, but that is what the literacy skills that they look at first month is. Miss Barty is going to go through the math skills. And they're a lot shorter. <laughs> these are some of the math skills for the first nine weeks of kindergarten. And as Miss Young said, we are going over these for the last um, third and fourth nine weeks. We've been doing some of these same skills as well. Um, uh, the students will be able to write numbers uh, 0 through 20, represent the number of objects with a written number of 0 through 20. And we've been working on practicing writing our numbers, the directionality of the numbers. We do poems when we introduce them at the beginning of the year to kind of help them figure out how to go, like how the numbers go. Like four will be down across and down some more. And I help, if they have, if they're struggling with how to write it, I kind of sing the poem so they can kind of figure out which way it goes, what it looks like, and how to write the number. Um, but that's something you can work on this summer too, as well um, with that. Uh, when counting objects, say the numbers in the standard order, pairing each uh, object with only with one and only one number, one one correspondence, making sure they're counting each of the things. A lot of times, especially at the beginning of the year, when we count, they have to count 15, and they'll just start randomly counting, and they won't actually touch the block. They won't actually count. They're just counting out loud. They're not actually counting the objects. So I make them slow down, take their time, make sure they're touching each one. Sometimes I even have them move them so that they can make sure they've counted each one and aren't missing anything with that. Um, and then understand that the last number name they said tells what they counted. So if they're saying counting five, they know they say five, there's five objects. If they counted 10, when they say 10, there's a set of 10. Um, and regardless of their arrangement, so if you gave them five and you mixed them up and had them count them again, but they know that it's still gonna be five, even though they are in different positions and not in the same position, there's still five. Um, and then understand that each successive number refers to a quantity that's one larger. So if they had six blocks and you added a block, they know that six is less than seven, that seven's going to be a bigger quantity, larger than seven, or larger than six, excuse me. And then they can correctly name shapes regardless of their orienta orientations or overall size. So a triangle is still a triangle no matter how it's turned or how big it is or how small it is. That we can change it, turn it, and it's still gonna be the same shape because of just, you know, the number of sides. And also, one thing that's not on here, and I don't know if they focus too much on it with the first nine weeks, but we've already started here, is simple addition and subtraction problems. We teach them what it means to add and what it means to subtract, and we do just basic ones up to 10 is what we focus on. So that could be something just to throw in there too, if you do some fun stuff with them this summer. Is it my turn? It's your turn. Uh, so, my portion is now after hearing what all these lovely ladies with tons of experience have told you about your child's expectations for kindergarten, here are some things you can do at home. And chances are that you can read these bullet points and read the sheet in front of you, but I did want to highlight a few things um, that we feel like are imperative and are easy things to do. Chances are you probably all work an eight hour job a day, so the last thing you're thinking about doing is sitting down for an hour to work on these kindergarten skills. So just taking two to five minutes of your time um, to do some of these things, have them write their name, um, explore shapes and colors. And exploring shapes and colors is as simple as having a scavenger hunt around your house. So can we find two rectangles in the house? Well, a light switch cover is a rectangle, a window is a rectangle, most refrigerators are rectangles, cabinets, and so on. So doing stuff like that inside and outside um, colors, can we find four green leaves? Can we find two pink flowers um, to go over colors and quantity? Those are things that are really simple that a lot of times when you read, you're like, well, how can I do that at home? I don't want to go buy curriculum to do this summer. Um, you don't have to do that. You can use the things that you have. Chances are you all have a junk drawer, if you're like me, that has rubber bands and Q-tips and cotton balls that you just have. Um, there's no telling what else is in there, but get out paper clips, Q-tips, and have them put them in order from smallest to biggest. Have them count them out. Have them sort them. Um, on this sheet, it talks about sorting laundry. That teaches them what sorting is, which is a skill that they will continue to build upon with time. If you don't have these already, um, 
Dollar Tree has flashcards for one dollar. They've got letters, they've got numbers, they've got color shapes. I think even simple addition and subtraction now. Teachers love Dollar Tree. If you don't go to Dollar Tree often, I encourage it. You can find just about anything there. My husband is like, who spends a hundred dollars in Dollar Tree? Me, I do, thank you. Um, I have a classroom. Anyway, but just like Ms. Taylor was saying, if you have a good attitude about showing interest in learning, if you have a good attitude about reading, chances are your children will be more motivated to do that as well. We have a great local library where you can go and get books. Um, that's a great place to teach them something about their community, plus also, you know, sitting down with them and reading books if you don't have a library at home, per se. And a library doesn't have to be 50 books. It could be five books, and you're just going over the simple things, like Ms. Young said, the front of the book, the back of the book, where do we begin, who is the author, who is the illustrator, simple things that they're going to have to know when going into kindergarten. We also have uh, on our Facebook PTO page, during COVID, like Ms. Spirit said, we had to learn how to teach virtually. And that was a very big thing for everybody in this room. Um, how do we as parents now become a parent, an employee, and a teacher all in one? And how do we find the time to do that? And so one thing that we did was we created videos of things you can do at home with the simple things like counting rocks, Q-tips, um, going through your house, building, taking sticks to build their name and gluing them on a sheet of paper. And you can find all those videos on our Facebook page still. They're not great, don't watch mine, thank you. Uh, I went back and watched the video from last year to this and I was like, boy, I'm so excited they asked me to do this again. I looked great on there. Uh, but build on what they like. One of you said something about different learning styles. You have a lot of kids in this building who love music, who love art, and they're not the sit down and attend to a 10 minute task if it's just gonna be paper and pen. They like to, to make something, they like, they like to hear something. I have a daughter who will be two in July and it is never too early to start that stuff and it is never too late. She loves to read books and she also loves to sing. My husband is extremely musically talented and he's, she has a little piano, he's in there like making beats to the ABCs and counting and she's not two and can count to 20 and can say her ABCs. And so build on what they like because chances are they're gonna be more interested and engaged in it if they like it. Um, that might be their favorite TV show even. If they like Bluey or Paw Patrol or whatever, take those characters and do some math skills with them and have some imaginary play with those little characters because they will be engaged in that already because they've shown interest in it. On the back it says um, some things about math and letters. We have magnets on our refrigerator. A lot of people do that when children are young or the little letters in your bathtub. But building on that, if you have old newspapers or magazines, you can do letter hunts and make them start working on you know those fine motor skills, snipping papers, trying to cut out those letters and making a collage of how to spell their name. So I know Sawyer, but have her find S-A-W-Y-E-R and have her glue that so she's working on not only letter identification, but a fine motor skill so she's cut and paste and then putting those letters in the correct order to spell her name. And so that's a bunch of skills tied into one. And again, most of us have an old book or magazine or newspaper laying around. So I don't want you to think like, man, they're asking a lot of us. We gotta go buy all this stuff. You probably have all of this at home. Just build on what you have and try. If you, I think all of us naturally as educators, we have that little, I'm not creative at all, but there's like that little bit of creativity back there that we're like, hey, we gotta use that box sometimes. And everybody has that, that little box. So just try to think of things that you can use at home to make learning fun from them that does not take much time. The last two things I was gonna say is one thing on here that is not touched on a ton but we have seen more and more of is our social emotional. Um, and I, I teach inclusion and inclusion um, is a very wide range of, it could be a disability, it could just be a developmental delay, but it also can be social emotional. And we have had many, many children come in and they just do not have appropriate coping skills. And so more than anything, if I can get this across, more than wanting them to write their name, more than wanting them to count to 100, have them believe in themselves. I mean, like, I can get emotional talking about that, but every single night with my daughter, I'm like, 
Let's say it together, Mary. Say, I'm brave, and she can say it now by herself. I'm brave, I'm strong, I'm fabulous, which is fabulous. <laughs> but build their self-esteem. Make them feel like somebody. We as adults want to feel like somebody. We need to be affirmed that we're doing a good job. Make them feel like somebody. And when they're upset, affirm that it's okay to be upset. Every single person in this room has a bad day. And it is okay to have a bad day. But how do we get through that bad day? Well, we get through that by talking about it. We don't get through that by hitting somebody or throwing something across the classroom to get attention. We do that with the language skills are appropriate. If your child is nonverbal, pointing to something that helps them tell what's going on with them because they don't have that ability. And so social emotional has become just as important to me in the field that I'm in, and I would dare say every one of these teachers would agree, as all of those literacy skills and math skills, because you, you want your child to be successful or you would not be here, and one way they're gonna be successful is by believing in themselves. And I think the last thing is flashing into kindergarten. Oh wait, we have resources. Yes, this, this page here. Yeah, our local library, Dollar Tree. I had to put that in there again. I'm telling y'all Dollar Tree, don't sleep on it. Okay, it's good. <laughs> But all of these websites, if you do have access to the internet, they are great. If you do not have access to the internet, the local library does. So again, it's on there. Um, to get them, I mean, just going to the library also, like I said a minute ago, teaches them about community and teaches them what their community has to offer. And then Splash into Kindergarten gets the slide to itself. That will be July 18th through 19th, as you can see, from 9 until 2. And um, I'm going to say that that is going to be, I don't really know about kindergarten. It's usually at the kindergarten school that they will attend. Okay. And you will, they will send you out more information about it. So you don't just call their office. Yeah, they don't call the office and be like, what, is, no. what about Splash? But you should be getting information um, this summer about registering them for kindergarten. And then with that information, you should get information about Splash. And it's really a great, I would encourage you to send your child there. Like, send them to Splash. Because it's a great introduction. It's a great introduction to kindergarten, to their new school, to their new friends, to some of their new teachers. Because that first day is going to be, it's going to be hard. Y'all remember this day, you know, their first day here. Well, it's going to be a little different next year at kindergarten. Let me go ahead and prepare y'all. Um, they will love your baby just like we loved your baby, but it's going to be a bit, little bit different. So, um, be prepared for that. And, um, there's a big jump from here to um, kindergarten. And, and I'm going to be, I call Miss Young the wise owl of our school. I think she has the most experience. I definitely don't have the most experience. I'm going five years strong. But just in the five years that I've been here, one thing that is very common theme is, Everybody in this building is going to go over and beyond for your kid. In kindergarten, they're going to do that too, but the expectation just jumps. There's a lot more independent work. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't want to be able to start a task and finish it without a teacher to help them necessarily. Um, you know, that's, they gotta, you got to give them the directions, and they got to be able to go sit and do it. And, and so that's, you know, we started working on that here the last, you know, four to nine weeks as well, trying to get them ready for that as well. And I know that's, you do need to do that at home a lot of times to try to get them to go clean up whatever toys they're playing. It may take you 10 times telling them to go clean up toys. Uh, you know, but it's, Repetition is key. Yeah. yeah. But keep in mind um, all these at-home activities and stuff, and y'all be thinking of some stuff. You can Google things, but next year when they go to kindergarten, it's going to be a lot of more sit-down independent work, whereas here they learn through their play, through centers, um, and through group cooperation. Um, so when they get home next year, it might be tough for them to sit down and do their homework. But, like, let them have some fun while they do their homework, or let them have some fun, then come back and sit down and do your homework. But... Just give, give them a little grace next year, especially in the beginning. We've been known to be the Disney World of Tupelo. Um, <laughs> can we say that arrogantly? No, no, no. No. Okay, you good. With all humility, <laughs> we're the best. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but they'll, I mean, they'll be fine. Like, I feel like we don't want to terrify you, but there is no. a big jump. There is a different expectation. <clears throat> And Those kindergarten teachers are going to love your babies, yeah. I promise. If they don't, contact us. No, <laughs> <laughs> no they will. They will.
they will love your baby. Those K the K through two principles are gonna love your babies. They're gonna be well taken care of. Do y'all have any questions? Not for me, but any of these three. <laughs> anyone? Anyone virtually have any questions? There's this is live. I know. <laughs> Um, Savannah said those videos were on Facebook. They're also, ECEC has a YouTube channel that has videos on it. What's it called? Like ECEC? EC, <laughs> ET2 for Rose? Oh, I'll have to look it up. <laughs> don't share information if you don't know it. <laughs> Just Google ECEC Tupelo. It there should is pop something up. on this chat. Maybe ECEC TPSD, something like that. Is there